This is the documentary of Tamariki's voyage from Hobart, Tasmania to Picton, New Zealand in May 2019. Tamariki is a 45-foot timber ketch owned by Peter Mortimer from Auckland. She has been cruising the Pacific for a number of seasons. This last season saw her sailing from New Zealand to Australia via Vanuatu, New Caledonia and Chesterfield Reef, where Peter slowly worked his way down the eastern coast of Australia to Tasmania, arriving in time for the biannual Wooden Boat Festival, and to meet up with Canadian cruising friends Serge and Joanne on their yacht Sperari, a 35-foot Southern Cross design. Now that winter was arriving, it was time to return to New Zealand, and Peter had invited his son James and me to crew the yacht across the Tasman Sea. Saturday the 27th of April, and I left for Hobart, Tasmania, to find Pete and Tamariki on the harbour dock. After dropping my bags, we walked into the Salamanca market, and Pete shouted me a welcoming beer. A beautiful dawn on Monday morning. In the afternoon, James arrived with his beloved Jenica. Tuesday morning, and we're leaving the dock to get fuel. There was a high-pitched whine at idle, which James explained was the clean propeller. Royal Yacht Club of Tasmania. After filling with diesel, we returned to the dock, and as it was such a good day, I hired a car, and we all set off to go up Mount Wellington. The view from the top at 1,271 metres is fantastic. We could see the Derwent River wind its way down past Hobart, on out to the Tasman Sea. Good cell phone reception for James here, but it's known to be windy with a temperature 10 degrees lower than at sea level. It sure was windy. One of the features of the mountain is the dolerite columns. With the cold temperature, we were pleased to get back into a warm car and enjoy our last view of the Derwent River on descent. The weather wasn't playing ball. All the models weren't aligning, and depressions were predicted by some, but not others. It looked like no window till after the coming weekend, so we decided we should make use of the time to explore some of the local sites and go to Port Arthur. On a grey, still morning, we set off for Port Arthur, just over 40 nautical miles away across Storm Bay. Iron Pot Lighthouse. We got a bit of wind after lunch, but it looked like Port Arthur was too far for one day, so we headed into Nubina for the night, passing a large fish farm on the way in. Going out the gap there, halfway between. We're leaving Nubina, heading round to Port Arthur. It's about 18 mile trip. Passing Cape Raoul, quite a sight with its columnar dolerite. I remember seeing the cape and shots of yachts in the Sydney Hobart rounding it, which made it a special moment for me sailing around such a famous landmark. There was nice light as we motored into Port Arthur, with the old brick buildings glowing in the sunshine.
Fortunately, we could pick up a free public mooring buoy in sheltered water close to the shore. Marine and Safety Tasmania conveniently provides a number of moorings around the coast, and they are available on a first come, first served basis. Pete assembled his nesting dinghy, and we headed ashore to explore. Showing off, aren't you? Yeah. Well, he's not even flapping. Yeah, they got the pressure wave. So we're sailing across. Sailing across Storm Bay in about 20 knots from the south, and we're doing a nice. 7.87 Everything under control as we have morning tea and our chocolate bickies. Yeah, we need some more chocolate bickies. Right. Just gonna buy a case of them before we go. It was back to the supermarket to top up with fresh supplies. James preparing one of our meals for on passage. But tonight we're going out to get fish and chips for our final meal ashore before we last set supper. The last supper. We're, Even we're though Serge says we shouldn't go, we're going. Well, Monday came and the forecast had changed. Bugger, can't leave. This was very frustrating and it put a real spanner in the works for James as by the time he would get back to New Zealand it was now past a planned outing on Steinlager and Lyon New Zealand. With no clear prospect of when we would go James pulled the plug and booked his flight home. The large super yacht left, no doubt able to outrun the bad weather and James packed up his beloved Jenica and got his flight home. As the weather would probably not turn for about a week, Pete and I decided to do a further trip to explore inside Bruni Island and the Huon River heading up to Signet. We saw a basking seal where they hold their flipper in the air to warm up. The Kettering to Bruni Island ferry was busy with their daily schedule. No real wind, so more motoring. We passed a sunken yacht, always a horrible sight to see, and we were trying to work out how it happened. On to Signet, a small settlement known for its swans and artisan studios. The next morning, we had some light rain, but it was time to walk into town. After a kangaroo pie, we found the local butcher to get a nice steak for dinner. Couldn't resist a photo of his quirky advertising. It was about five degrees that day, so we were both searching for gloves to keep our hands warm. inky day as we motor back from Signet to Kettering.
We stopped for the night in Barnes Bay in North Bruny Island and had a beautiful sunrise, after which we motored across to Kettering to get more diesel. Coming back from Kettering, a headwind developed and we opened the throttle to push us along. Off went the engine bilge alarm. Uh-oh! The shaft seal was leaking under load. The look on Pete's face said it all. Action was required before heading out into the Tasman Sea. He called up the marina at the Royal Yacht Club of Tasmania and fortunately they could take us straight away. So it was a left turn to the haul out. They had a very ingenious way of moving yachts around the yard with a little push motor which could move the cradle on railway lines around the level yard. We worked well into the evening to replace the shaft seal with a bit of extra work required to fix a cross threaded nut. High and dry we couldn't relaunch for another day as the yard bosun had the day off. Time for Pete to do the prop with a silicon coating. Relaunched on a fine Saturday morning, we returned to the Hobart Harbour Wall to catch up on washing. The weather was finally shaping up for a Tuesday departure, leaving after a passing front on the Monday. We're on our way and Pete's taking us, going to take us through the Denison Canal to head a bit north. Keep out of the swells mate. So how are you feeling about the trip? Oh, I'm nervous about you Rog. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we'll be alright. I feel a bit more confident than I did um, a few days ago when the wind seemed to be doing its damnedest to create all sorts of mess in the middle. And Bob McDavid, when he sent us the route plan, he didn't say, don't go. Yep. You got any concerns? No, no. Um, just that, you know, the skipper's going to slow us down and, and I'm going to try and speed us up. Yeah, well, it'll be a tussle all the way, Rog. For the Denison Canal so we've hove to just the mainsail held in tight and uh, we're drifting slowly forward sideways about 1.7 knots nice even course so that should kill a bit of time That's it's quite interesting looking over the side you can see the large eddies coming off the keel as we drift sideways Makes it very comfortable. So comfortable, in fact, that Pete's going to use the time and put the, put the chicken in the pot. Put the chicken in the pot, mate. After negotiating the Marion Narrows, it was a relief when we successfully emerged into the Tasman Sea on sunset.
All the elements seemed to be in our favour as dolphins guided our departure with a rising moon and a lovely westerly breeze in the setting sun. What more could we ask for? Peter requested a trip forecast from well-respected New Zealand weather forecaster Bob McDavid. Bob had previously warned of large swells coming up from depressions in the Southern Ocean. Hence, his recommended course was to head north-northeast quickly to avoid the large swells. I have shown a simplified version of the swell contours. Once well north, we would turn east and track across with the movement of a high-pressure system. Maximum anticipated swells would be about 4 metres with a period of 9 seconds. We had a front predicted to pass on Saturday the 18th of May. The weather on arrival to New Zealand would be forecast later in the trip. We had a single sideband radio fitted with a Pactor 3 modem with a sail mail subscription. This allowed us to receive short text emails at sea as well as weather grid files of updated forecasts. We also received a forecast chart showing wind speed, wind gusts, wind direction, air pressure, sea temperature, air temperature and rain for the trip. Quite a lot of information to include in one chart. It proved uncannily accurate with the wind gusts when we left matching the predicted 29 knots. Day 2. Day 2. More sandwiches. We've got um, cheese and bacon toasted sandwiches. That's the one. We're pulled out, but not enough wind to keep us going. So we're just running the motor to gently push us along. The sunset on Tamariki. Beginning of day three. We've just turned off the motor for a while for our morning radio schedule with Sparare. We're about 30 odd miles behind us. And before we start the engine again, Captain Pete said, I'll check the oil. So he's gone down into the engine room and dis in here, Rog. disappeared in there. The task today is to fix the starboard navigation light. On our first night out, Serge had said he couldn't see it. Pete tested the voltage at the light and he was only getting one and a half volts. He suspected the wire had got some water in it. So we managed after about four attempts to get a new wire up the pulpit leg to the light and all was well again. Of course, as you would have it, as soon as we put full sail up, the wind comes barreling in, and so does the albatross. So we may have to reduce sail as soon as we put it all up. I have to get the captain munching on his sandwiches. Yeah, good sandwich, right? Yeah, what would you like for lunch today, captain? Oh, we better stop the frying stuff, we're using too much butter. <laughs> and of course, the wind eases a little bit, but it's quite nice sailing now, seven and a half knots yeah. on day four. Sai Maru. We altered course to go behind us yeah. after the AIA showed we were on a collision course. Captain Pete called him up. He answered immediately and said, Stand on, we will change course. Have a safe journey. So that was very lucky because just as we were calling, 
the wind died and we lost maneuverability. But now everything's all right. Day four, Friday, as we're reefing the main. Sunrise on Saturday. It's getting earlier as we travel further east. It's laundry day. Clean up all round. And yeah. use the sun and the calm conditions to clean up the ship and clean up the crew but it, it's a bit odd Pete having a t-shirt on with a with a hat <laughs> yeah. well, it's amazing the difference that a shower will make <laughs> Uh, no, that is correct. That is correct. So um, we'll uh, touch base again at about nine o'clock tomorrow morning and see how you went through the night. Okay, be safe and uh, have a good night for you both and we'll talk to you tomorrow morning. What is there to say about last night? I'm glad it's over. <laughs> the rough condi rough, rougher conditions. Well, and it wasn't horrendous, so it was just yeah. uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable. 25 plus, three or four meters seas. Rod said there's a bit of rain a couple of times. The good ship Tamariki seemed to be handling it. Quite well, we were doing somewhere between six and a half and eight and a half knots. Yeah, well, I've always flown over and wondered what was down below. Now I know. <laughs> Lots of water. Here we had a fishing boy in the night, boy number seven. At least it showed his position. What did we work out? We did 80, 80 kilometres up and down waves between here and New Zealand. Work that one out. wind has just come in. Yes it has. Peter stuck his nose out and sniffed it. Yep. Decided to put a reef in. Yep. And no sooner had he done that and the wind came. That's good eh? It's the way to get the wind to come. Oh, candles and all. Well here you go Rog, happy birthday. Wow. Birthday at sea. Happy 40th whatever it is. In a bit. Mount Gay, On 1703. Yeah, black label. Yes, do you? Yeah, but the change flowing far. The element okay. needs to be replaced. Not the element. After motoring all night, we uh, turned the motor off just to do our radio schedule with Sparare. 
and a little breeze sprang up. We're about 400 miles from our waypoint in Cook Strait. Got quite a big swell running. It varies, sometimes it's a bit flatter and then other times it's been up to four meters. But they're long periods, so it doesn't give us a problem. So we'll run like this for a little while and see what happens. So somehow Roger's got two tall to do the dishes, which is a, uh, a, a serious disadvantage in the design of the boat. This is just to show you that sailing is hard work. Yes, it is hard work, Roger. And, and stressful. Stressful, you would have wouldn't believe the stress. And the freezing temperatures we had to survive. Yeah, no, no, it's just awful. <laughs> Got himself a movie and uh, he's whiling away today because we're only doing five knots watching a movie. It's a good space to be. Well, up on deck after watching the movie. Looks like we're finally getting a little bit of wind from aft. Yeah. Well, there's Roger in his place of happiness with his uh, little GoPro stuck right out there. On the end of his extended, extended, extended pole cam arm, taking pictures of us going east. And a nice day it's turned out to be too. We've got about 15 knot breeze finally after motoring for bloody weeks. This is just to show that we have standards. Yeah, we're civilized sometimes. Yes. So, cheers. Cheers to you. Happy birthday yesterday. About 280 something miles to go. To the In champagne sailing conditions at, at last. Yeah. Sliding downwind, wing and wing. Yep. After two weeks. I was surprised how emotional I felt seeing the South Island and Farewell Spit appear at dawn. Not just because I was home, but probably because the Tasman is known for some mean weather and this trip we had been kindly let through. Because he saw the land first, here's his Mauro bar. Oh, I get the Mauro bar. You get the Mauro bar for being the most observant crew. But I must say, it's just a matter of fate and yeah. timing was that I was on watch, so... Thanks for keeping for us being, safe, Rog. For being such a good captain. Thanks for keeping us safe. You get half. I get half? Oh, your generosity. Half back. Motoring round to Picton across Golden Bay. No wind for sailing. Well, I tempted fate with that statement. Lo and behold, 25 knots raced in from the northwest, and with three reefs only, we barreled off at seven knots towards Cook Strait. The sea jumped to about two metres in 10 minutes. We were meant to time our arrival for daybreak at the entrance to Queen Charlotte Sound. We had to jibe off Stevens Island in the middle of the night and then run in behind Cape Jackson and drop anchor at about three in the morning. Not the tame end to the trip we hoped for. I even had to put my wet weather jacket on for the first time for warmth. Still, you have to expect anything at sea and this was just a reminder. Our last sail as we go down Queen Charlotte Sound. 
We left the Triple Reef main in just to show that we're real sailors. Even though Picton is the official port of entry, Serge and Joanne on Sparare made to Nelson, some 100 miles closer, as they were short of fuel after we both spent about 100 hours motoring. To our minds, it didn't make sense having a port of entry further than Meat B after many days at sea. Waikawa Marina. <laughs> <laughs>